Happy Friday, sociologists. Welcome to our next lesson in the sequence on global development. Now, it occurs to me that one of the things I haven't done, which I usually do before this course, is print off a series of booklets and hand them to you. However, for obvious reasons, I've not been able to print those off. I uh, also haven't been able to update them. What I will do is I will put them on Shama Homework just as soon as I can update them. All that's in them is a broad outline of the topic headings from the introductory lesson, uh, some graphics that, and infographics that clarify things and make it easier to understand terms later in the course, um, the sample paper and the sample mark scheme so you know how to do the exam questions. However, I don't feel too bad as we're not planning on doing any sample exam questions just yet, though we are moving towards them. The next topic that we're going to do, as promised, is the different types of development theory. And the one we're going to start with is modernization theory. It's kind of the big daddy. Uh, it's not the first or the earliest theory, but it is by far the most influential. In many ways, I'd argue it's the most influential theory that you've never heard of. And it still runs the world today. And we're seeing it right now in the moves to relax lockdown and coronavirus because of the economy. And this idea that the economy is important and will support society later, and without opening the economy, things will be dangerous. That's modernization theory. That's what it's all about. Um, and so I'm going to start there. Forgive me. Here we go. This is a blank screen. But observe, there are now pictures. And if you're going to play this properly, what, ooh, what will happen is... I will say pause and you'll pause the video and come up with your answers before I reveal what the answers are. Uh, so here we go. I'll remove myself. These are four images. Can you work out what they are? Pause the video now and we'll discuss afterwards. So pause. I'm going to assume you've paused and played the game properly. In the top left there, what did you think that was? Ah, good answer. It is in fact, hang on, why aren't you working? There we go. A street in Somalia's capital. Of course it would be Somalia in 2014. Uh, so that's actually a capital city street. And what I'm showing here, I think you can tell, is a lack of development. I think we all know, despite the fact that we couldn't quite define the terms of rich and poor, that is clearly a poor country. What about the top right? Good answer, of course. It's Tokyo City in 2014, the same year as Somalia's capital. And you see the Clear distinction. On the left, you've got a lack of development. You have poverty. And on the right, you have a very clear indication of prosperity and development. It's very hard to define, but when you see it, you know you're seeing it. Bottom left, it's an Angolan town in 2012. So this is in Africa. Uh, it's what you'd expect from Africa. I mean, there's a lot of cars there, and they are four by four. But they have to be. You look at that street, and again, you recognise that this is not developed. However, there are signs that things are changing. You've got high-rise buildings in the background. And, of course, the last image is kind of obvious. It is, of course, Duffield from 2012. I haven't updated it. And to be fair, I don't think I'd need to. It still looks like Duffield does. What's the point I'm making? Well, some things are very clear to see. Tokyo City is clearly developed. Somalia and Angola clearly aren't. Duffield doesn't really fit either mould, though you'd still say it's developed. So what is it about development? How do you get from one to the other? Why are Somalia and Angola so underdeveloped compared to Japan and the UK? Or if you prefer, why are some countries more developed than others? It's not like we had a stepping stone at the start. There's no genetic code that sets up one population as being better at development than another one. So what's caused this disparity? What we're gonna to move to do is uh, you will find these two slides attached to show my homework. There'll be a separate file called cards. Uh, they won't appear in your version of the PowerPoint. This one is the five stages of roster, and you've got five titles. One, two, three, four, five. You've got the overall title here, and then you've got two things, one on culture, one on uh, economics and economy. And the idea is you put the two together under that with that heading. We'll check these next lesson. So it's a print off cut and stick task. I'd usually do it in an obnoxious color like orange. Uh, you can do it in any color you like, of course, at home or not. You can copy them out by hand. It, it really doesn't matter, provided you have a record of it somehow. The second task we're going to be doing today, and we are going to be doing it later, is here are a bunch of countries. And the, the 
this bit here is about uh, the economy, this bit here is about society, so each one has two boxes. And again, I'd have done these in yellow in case you're wondering uh, for the lesson, and they get progressively more difficult. These three here are supposed to be easy, these six here are harder, and these ones are based on the actual figures rather than me writing up what the figures mean. And the idea was you could put them under the correct heading. And again, put them under the correct heading, don't stick these ones down before next lesson, and we'll discuss the answers, or rather I'll go through what the answers might be. Hopefully you'll have shared with me some of what you think, and that way I can put it into the lesson. Uh, if you haven't, I'll simply wait and do it on the Friday's lesson next week. So to help you with those tasks, because you, you can't do them now, and I appreciate that, I need to go through some notes for you. Same rule applies. Write down what works, add in any annotations. If you need to pause the video, go back, repeat things. That's why it's a video, and that's why I'm taking th uh, you through the PowerPoint like this, so you can visually see where I'm up to. When it comes to theories about development, why some countries are more developed than others, there are three main areas. There are modernization theories, which I've chosen to show with this image of a bloke called Walt Rostow. Uh, Rostow's five stages, you've already met his name. He's a very influential figure, but he's not a sociologist. He was an economist employed by the US government, and he came up with a series of ideas to try and win the Cold War. I'm not joking. And modernization theory was an outgrowth of that political aim. The second set of theories are under development, dependency and world system theories. And they're based on this man with an absolute hefter of a beard. It's Karl Marx, a German living in London who used French terms to explain his theory, because of course he did. And in many ways during the 1950s, 60s and 70s, it dominated half the planet. It was what modernization theory was designed to undermine. Uh, but it also includes things like neo-Marxist theory, which comes about after people like Rostow have done their thing. So make of that what you will. And the final set of theories, I've shown it here with a bloke called Hayek, who you may know if you've done any economics, uh, is neoliberalism, which kind of bleeds into modernization theory. So I'll mention it in modernization theory. There won't be a separate thing on neoliberalism. It's an offshoot. It's an outgrowth. It's uh, an extreme version of so keep that in mind. I won't do that separately. It will come under the heading of modernization theory. In your notes, highlight it somehow so you know it's separate. So what is modernization? Well, it's based on functionalism, which you'll of course remember from our work on families and households. The idea that societies work the way they do because that's the way societies work. And if society's needs change, then the theory that governs it will also change. Society changes to fit the needs of its population. A modernization theory grew out of that idea that things are the way they are because they work. And so what it did, it took the modern era of the time and tried to understand why it worked. Rather than looking for flaws or problems, it was looking for why it was the best that had ever been in history. That's a functionalist argument. It was born in the United States and the precepts, the idea behind modernization theory, had been around in the United States from the 1940s and 50s. And it sort of revolved around this idea of, well, what the US was able to do. Here you have two clear images of US development that was superior to anything they were seeing in Europe following the Second World War and indeed before the Second World War. If you look at this first image here in Times Square, you've got two huge roads with significant motorised traffic. This is in the 1940s. It wouldn't look out of place in the 1960s. It wouldn't look out of place now. But this is the 1940s, when the rest of Europe was taking video and photographs in black and white, when cars were very rare, and advertising certainly hadn't reached the height of that Pepsi Cola advert up there on the building. The other thing they had were refrigerators, white goods, huge things that allowed them to keep food for longer. In Europe, these had not yet hit. White goods were a thing that came in in the easy credit years in the UK, for example, in the 1950s. So the concept of being able to store food and go out for a weekly shop was uniquely American, uniquely statesian, because Canada hadn't got these either, so, and nor Mexico, so I should really prefer to it as statesian. It's specifically the United States. And the United States, 
with some backing and some reasoning, believe that they were the best possible version of any nation on the planet economically. And you look at those images and you think, well, they're not that wrong. The reason they were so far ahead, so went the theory, was industrialization. Now, you and I both know that industrialization, the industrial revolution, began just up the road from school at Cromford. And it began in Britain. And it began in a very particular way. However, you must understand that the people in the United States that were coming up with this had a United States view of what industrialization was. You will note the order when we talk about it later doesn't quite fit, but more on that when we talk about critiques of modernization theory. For now, well, it'll make sense. And it's key. The industrialization is the way you develop. Before you are industrialized, so goes the theory, you are undeveloped. Therefore, human beings start out undeveloped, they industrialize, and they become developed. They become modern. So, you look at the third world, what needs to change? How then do they become like the developed world? And that is where the theory lives. It's kind of a roadmap. It kind of explains why some countries are more developed than others and offers a way for those less developed countries to become more developed. Our top image in the middle column here is Egypt. This is Alexandria at the turn of the century, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Nowadays, Egypt is seen as a third world country. And you can see here with its tram lines and people in very 1800s dress and not terribly large buildings, that it is a world away from that uh, very busy street scene with all of those cars in the 1940s in the United States. Clearly, it's on the right path, but more needs to be done. At the bottom there, you have an image of what is now North Korea during the Korean War in the 1950s. And although it's in colour, you get a feel that there aren't as many cars, there are no high-rise buildings, advertising is a minimum, and therefore this is undeveloped compared to the United States at the same time. What did they need to do to fix that? I mean, they've got a modern army. You can see the soldiers down there in uniforms. They are holding guns that were perfectly capable of fighting wars. So what had to be done to develop North Korea? Enter Walter Rostow, and he came up with a model. Now, when we come to talk about modernization theory, the Rostow model, these five stages, aren't as important as they appear. You'll never have to use them in an exam answer. Obviously, therefore, you're going to ask, well, why do we need to know them? Because they're background. Without understanding the order, without understanding how it works, it's really, really hard to use modernization theory. And when I develop modernization theory into the thing you're actually going to use with all its different facets, it helps if you remember this very simple way of trying to understand where countries are according to modernization theory. You don't have to categorize them in an essay, but unless you understand this in the back of your mind when you're talking about modernization theory, it will be really, really difficult to understand. Now, I've just shown that. The first task, and if you're not gonna cheat, you won't go back and check. The first task with that first set of cards, the one that's headed Rostow's five stages. Can you work out what order the economy and culture needs to go in in order to go from the least industrialized countries to the most industrialized countries and therefore Rostow's five stages with those five headings in the correct order. You're going to pause the video now and have a go. So, pause. I'm going to assume you've done that. Here are the answers once again. Uh, and if you've got a photographic memory, I guess I ruined it. But it starts with the traditional society, and it's based on subsistence and farming. Subsistence is growing just enough to stay alive and without any extra, any surplus to sell at market. Farming means it's an agricultural based society. They work on the land. They'll all be farmers, see? And in my mind, all farmers talk with a West Country accent. Don't know why, they just does. So they works on the land, see? and they works with fields, and they may have some animals and livestock, but mostly they be growing things. They might go fishing, they might 
look after forestry, so they grow their own resources in terms of wood, uh, to turn into charcoal for power, for example, or to turn into building materials. And they may have some rudimentary and basic mining uh, facilities, so they, they pull coal out of the ground, for example, or they have tin working, or they have lead mining, a bit like Derbyshire before Cromford. That's traditional society. Now, the culture aspect I haven't mentioned here, but you've got it in your notes already. And that's this idea that it's patriarchal, a scriptivist, i.e. you are born and you know what job you're going to get based on which family you're born into and who your parents are. And it's tribal, basically. People do things for the good of the whole rather than themselves. Individuals, as we understand them, simply don't exist. Sooner or later, that changes, and you end up with what Rostow called the preconditions for takeoff. A bit like a, a, an aeroplane moving down a runway, ready to move into the sky. And this is where they build the infrastructure that is needed before development can take place. For example, a transport network. Uh, that would be canals or railways, roads, even airports. There would be money from farming. They would start to produce more than they needed. They can then export those goods to other places that cannot grow the same crops. For example, coffee. Coffee grows in very specific areas and very specific climates around the world. You can't grow coffee plants in large enough numbers in the UK to feed the UK's coffee drinking habit. Or you can't grow tea plants in the UK in sufficient numbers to feed the UK's tea drinking habit. They have to be gr grown elsewhere and they have to be grown at a surplus and they are sold and they start creating for themselves a bit of cash, if you look after it right. Capital, we call that. Extra money that is not necessary immediately. You also start creating power supplies. You take that coal you've been ripping out of the ground and you start burning it in power stations, or maybe you have water mills, or maybe you have uh, windmills, but mainly you use the resources you have to create electrical power. Furthermore, you produce communications. You have a postal service, you have telegraph, you might use uh, broadband, whatever. However you're staying in touch, you have a communications network. Once you have these things, the infrastructure, the roads, the canals, the railways, the airports, the power systems, the extra capital, then you have the preconditions for takeoff. You'll already start spotting flaws in this if you remember your history work in year eight. Takeoff is your industrial revolution. And it's the introduction and rapid growth of manufacturing industries, people taking raw materials like, for example, cotton, applying processes to them and making finished goods. Once this happens, you have to transport goods rapidly across country in order to sell them and to export them. And this implies much better infrastructure. So your communications get better, your power systems get better and more centralised, your roads, your railways, they improve. There is financial investment. There is so much extra money, capital, floating around in the country that people who are rich start throwing money at things that may produce profit in the future. And thus you end up with an industrial boom with large amounts of new businesses, new ideas, innovations and applications. And this leads to a cultural change. People stop thinking in terms of the community and start thinking in terms of individualism. They start thinking in terms of doing things that they are good at. It becomes, or starts to become, a meritocracy. At that point, said Rostow, there is a drive towards maturity, stage four. These new ideas and new technologies improve and replace older industries. So mining may be replaced by the service economy. Economic growth spreads throughout the country. Everybody gets a share in the extra capital sloshing around. People buy new products. Where once they had rolls of cloths and loincloths, they now wear the latest fashions. Where once they had to go large distances to collect water, now it's piped to their homes because they can afford to pay for it. Yes, in Rostow's model, the state provided infrastructure does not exist. It's all privately owned. After a long time, the dry, well, I say long time, uh, Rostow suggested it could be as little as 50 years, you move to high mass consumption and it's conspicuous consumption. 
Now note the term, it's where you take resources and you consume them, you destroy them. But you can do that because so much is being produced, you're producing extra. Or as Rostow puts it, people have more wealth and so buy services and goods. You enter a consumer society. Keep in mind when he came up with this theory, that was what the United States was. At this point, he said, states can develop welfare systems to look after those less fortunate. Not in the drive to maturity, not in the takeoff, not in the preconditions for takeoff, not in the traditional society. Only now do we start caring about those less fortunate. And that's crucial. Rostow firmly believed this. Before this point, it simply wasn't possible. There wasn't enough extra capital to account and look after, um, account for, sorry, and look after those less fortunate. At this point, trade will begin to expand as other people desperate for the goods that you're producing will trade with you the things that they are producing. And this makes incredible amounts of profit and way more capital. Those are the five stages, the answers, if you will, to what you just did. He therefore believed that the West, note the capital for West, was at the best point along a historical path. The West was at, or very close to, high mass consumption because they were fully developed. Who are the West? Well, that would be West Germany. It would be Western Europe. It would be the United Kingdom, already covered under Western Europe, I know. It would be Canada. Uh, it would be the United States. It would be Australia, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Those are the West. I recognize not all of them are actually on the West, but we're on a globe, so the West is subjective. He then said the development that they'd all undertaken, and he argued that they all followed these same five stages, should be used as a template. If you could work out where you were as a country on this five stage model, you could then work out what it was you needed to do next in order to end up just as developed, just as effective, just as wealthy as the West, capital W. He used the term that these countries need to accept the need for. That language is interesting and will feed into one of the criticisms that we will level after we've talked about the main theory at modernization theory. And one of the criticisms is that it is um, ethnocentric. And if you know what I mean by ethnocentricity at this point, then well done. You've done a lovely lo amount of research and I am going to enjoy teaching you. Um, if you don't, don't worry. I perfectly accept that at the moment that word sticks in there and you go, what does that even mean? That's fine. Don't worry about that. You might already have heard about it from Mr. Cuthbert. It's basically that it's based on a particular way of viewing things based on what you see around you. One thing that we can say about Rostow's five stages, for a man that was so keen on, <coughs> pardon me, meritocracy and the need for individualism, this is curiously deterministic. That is, it's based in, this will happen if you do X. There's no real freedom of action here. Don't do X, things won't happen. You have to do X in order to get this outcome. There are no other outcomes possible. So it's deterministic. You could argue that's a criticism, or you could argue that that's a simplification, or you could argue that it's a good thing because it's clear. Doesn't matter which you choose, just know that the term deterministic means all of those things. It's also materialist. It doesn't seem to take into account anything to do with politics, which is weird for a man who is a political advisor. He seems utterly uninterested in how the country is run. Is it a dictatorship? Is it a democracy? Are people politically free? He doesn't care. He argues that economics are the most important thing of all. And if people are comfortable, then it will not matter what government they live under. Now, that's fascinating. That's very similar to Karl Marx, though I don't think Rostow would like me to make that comparison for reasons I'll come on to later. But I just point that out. It's something to bear in mind. Oh yeah, so at this point, you had that second slide with three columns. The first column of three uh, was, uh, one of them was Germany. Uh, if I go back, hold on. Um, so we go back to these countries here. You've got Russia, USA, and Somalia, not Germany at all. What was I thinking? On the left-hand side there. That first column should be relatively easy to place Russia, the USA, and Somalia at different points on that map 
five stages. Have a go at that now. Okay, I'm going to assume you paused and had a go at that. In case it wasn't obvious, the USA is at high mass consumption. Uh, that's where it lives. Somalia is clearly at the bottom at the um, pre-industrial stage, the pre not even at preconditions. Russia, you could argue, is somewhere in the middle. Now, obviously, it's past the Industrial Revolution, but how far past is it in the drive to maturity? Kinda. So it's between those two stages, I suppose. You could make an argument that it's in the drive to maturity. You certainly can't make an argument that it's fully developed. The next six are a bit more complicated. So start, whoops, it is. starting with Nigeria, then Brazil, then Japan, China, India, and Greece. Can you work out where they go at the moment? Pause. I'm going to assume you've paused. And let's go through the answers. Nigeria is quite difficult to place. Certainly it appears to be at the middle of those five stages. Or perhaps not fully there yet. It's not at takeoff. It's not at preconditions, but it's not at takeoff. Perhaps between the two? You could argue it's more takeoff than preconditions, or you could argue it's more preconditions than takeoff. I wouldn't argue either way if you choose whichever one you've chosen. I don't mind. As long as you've got a reason for it, it could go in either column. Brazil is at the takeoff moment. It's part of the BRIC countries. It's definitely there. It's the next big thing. And under Bolsonaro, of course, it's been sort of supercharged on the economic path rather than, say, a path of equality and social uh, care. Japan? Well, obviously, it's high mass consumption. There's, there's nothing there. Though the culture doesn't seem to fit. Interestingly, Rostow's model doesn't really talk much about culture, except to say that it has to change. And Japan's culture, you might have said, well, the culture doesn't seem to fit at all. The culture seems much more like one of the early stages before the middle, because it does, and it is. And that's fascinating. We'll come on to Japan later. India, India is one of the BRIC nations. Again, it's a takeoff. It just is. China is one of the BRIC nations. You could argue that it's moving from takeoff to the drive to maturity. However, once again, it's got that very, very weird, highly developed welfare state, which should only come under the top end. And ancestor worship is still common, which means it should be at the bottom end. And what you're beginning to realise is that these countries don't fit neatly into these boxes. Of course, reality never does. But roughly speaking, China goes on the drive to maturity economically, but culturally, is all over the place. Greece! Well, that's an interesting one. Greece was at high mass consumption. However, since the crash of 2008 and the economic crises that followed, you could argue that Greece has moved down and is now in the drive to maturity. But if you do that, well, Rostow would look at you blankly. You can't move countries back down the ladder. Greece doesn't quite fit. It hints at potential flaws and problems for this theory in the future. The last three, Egypt, Germany, Bolivia. Okay, have a go, pause. Okay, I'm gonna assume you paused. Um, this is where it gets really interesting. And with these ones, they aren't as simple as they first appear because you've got to work out what the culture is like from the family size, from the religions and the order thereof, and it's not as simple as it might appear. What you do find is that Germany is very much in the developed area. Of course it is. And you find that Egypt is weirdly central, uh, but not possibly on the takeoff yet. It might just be on the preconditions for takeoff. Bolivia seems weirdly low. And that's an odd one because you've got these uh, mining, natural gas, petroleum and agriculture, soybeans, as its main industries. That would put it pretty down the bottom. And yet its GDP is reasonably high. Its uh, growth rate is incredible and its literacy is really high, like far higher than Egypt. Uh, its religion is Christianity, 100 percent. And its average family size well, it's pretty close to Egypt. So make of that what you will. My point being, these appear to fit rather easily, and perhaps they do. But it's not always as simple as that. So what's the point of all of this? Hopefully this has taken roughly an hour. Um, it shouldn't have taken more than that. And if it has, I apologise. And hopefully these notes have been helpful. 
you have now had the introduction to modernization theory. You now know what the five stages are, the order in which they appear, and you've got a rough idea of how to categorize countries according to that model. You also know that that model will not always be perfect, that some countries don't fit, and that there are hints this model might not be perfect. Don't worry, Rostow didn't set up modernization theory as it currently stands. He merely began the development of modernization theory. The flaws and problems with his theory were plugged by other thinkers almost as soon as he published it. And they are people that we are reasonably familiar with. People like Talcott Parsons, for example. What a lovely man with a beer belly. No, I don't think he drank beer. So we'll look at those next week on Tuesday when I start talking about what exactly modernization theory is. I've given you the basics, the bedrock. You will never, ever find yourself, I hope, writing out an answer that goes through all five stages of modernization theory, but hopefully you begin to understand why it is useful to know. I hope that this video has been useful. Do let me know if it hasn't been. Uh, put a comment in the uh, show my homework section and tell me if there's any problems or if there's anything you don't understand. I'll do my level best to try and clarify things for you. This is a complex topic. I'm hoping it's interesting. I'm hoping it's grabbed your attention. I'm hoping it's the sort of thing that you're going, oh, I hadn't really thought about that because most people haven't. Um, and like I say, modernization theory is one of the most influential theories that you've never heard of. Watch the news after this. See how many links you can make to this idea of uh, five simple stages that mod to modernize you have to industrialize and that if you haven't modernized, you are somehow morally less good culturally than those who have in the news. And, and I do mean talking about coronavirus. You'll see that a lot. It's an underlying assumption. However, I've talked long enough and hopefully I've talked in a way that is slow enough for you to understand and I haven't gabbled too much. It's my usual problem. Have a lovely day, Year 12, and hopefully you shall see me on Tuesday next week when I'll release the next in the series of the lessons. Uh, I won't do le uh, video lectures for literally every lesson because they're not appropriate, but I'll do them for the things I can um, and hopefully make sense of things. If you would prefer me not to, again, do let me know. Um, though I quite like doing this, as you can probably tell. Anyway, sorry. Have a lovely day, Year 12, and I'll see you in the next lesson.